I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about how do we boost neurotransmitters. So the take-home message is that there's a couple different approaches to making more neurotransmitter. You could take more, make more of it, or you could ensure that what you already have lasts for a longer period of time. And I'll get into some of the details of why some of these approaches are simpler or easier or more likely to succeed in the brain. All of this is embedded in the context of why would you want to make more neurotransmitters? So there's a sort of ongoing for 50 plus years idea that many of our mental health conditions are due to deficits or deficiencies in a neurotransmitter and simply creating more will remedy that situation. And for certain neurologic conditions, for example, for Parkinsonism, we know that a destruction and damage to dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra is responsible directly for many of the movement disorders and other problems associated with that condition. And boosting dopamine, although it doesn't change the underlying process that kills the substantia nigra cells, can help symptomatically and slow progression of the condition. But more often, when we're boosting neurotransmitters, we're probably not just having an immediate effect on elevating levels, but more often that boosting the neurotransmitters is serving as a signal to the brain that says, hey brain, make some new proteins, change how nerve cells talk to each other, change how strongly the connections are wired to each other. And these are slower, indirect results of messing boosting with neurotransmitter levels. If you needed more dopamine, you'd think that you could just eat foods that were rich in dopamine and you'd get more dopamine in your brain in the important areas. The difficulty with this is that most neurotransmitters, whether they're proteins or neuropeptides, such as neuropeptide Y or oxytocin, digested into their constituent amino acids, even smaller molecules like dopamine serotonin are broken down in the digestive system to smaller pieces. You create chemical soup that can help build back those neurotransmitters, but that can be made into hundreds of other substances as well. So just eating more of a certain neurotransmitter is very unlikely to boost neurotransmitter levels. Second piece related to this is that maybe then I could just take precursor molecule. So the example would be tryptophan as an amino acid. It's important for making serotonin. There's actually just two chemical modifications. Tryptophan goes into 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then 5-hydroxytryptophan is converted in 5-hydroxytryptamine. And that's another name for serotonin. So maybe I could just eat more turkey, get more tryptophan, and that would produce more serotonin. And in some cases, that works. But in other cases, it doesn't. One big reason, again, is the digestion, or we more specifically call it catabolism. So molecules are broken down into smaller molecules. There's something in particular called the first pass effect. The first pass effect is not a football term. It's not an on online dating phenomena. Substances that are absorbed by your digestive system go into the portal vein, which is a big vein that goes directly to the liver. And in the liver, there are high concentrations of chemicals, enzymes that break down other molecules, neutralize other molecules. So because of this first pass effect, if you inject a certain chemical into your blood, so for example, if you inject dopamine into your body, right into your bloodstream, more of it's circulating and available than if you swallow dopamine. Again, it's not just that it's broken down in the digestive system and digested, it's that it's going to the liver where there are enzymes that break it down readily. Skin patches are another way to get blood or get a drug into the blood system. A few other factors. Say you get your precursor molecule into your bloodstream, it's circulating. Then, and we'll sort of ignore the fact that there are nerves in the body as well. We're focusing on the brain here. How to get into the brain, there's something called the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier prevents the simple passage of most larger molecules, special transporters to get certain amino acids and other chemicals into the brain that are essential for the brain. But again, just providing more of a precursor in the general body circulation does not guarantee that you'll have a higher concentration of that in the brain. 
And then even after you pass the blood-brain barrier and get to the cells that are making whatever neurotransmitter, there's one last big cat, and that is related to what's called the rate-limiting step. And I'm going to jump back and use an analogy. So say you have a Tesla factory and you're trying to churn out more and more cars, but there's a slowdown on the assembly line. And the biggest barrier to making new cars is that it takes a long time to screw on one little widget on your left door frame. And you think, ah, you know, the chassis, the battery pack on the bottom, both of those are essential precursors for making cars. I'll just ship more battery packs into the factory, or I'll just ship more chassis into the factory. If that isn't related to the rate limiting step, all you'll do is have a back pile or stockpile of more chassis or more battery packs. Yes, they are absolutely essential for making a car. Yes, they are important precursors, but they're not tied to the rate limiting steps. You might hire more widget screwer honors, or you might design a system that makes a more simpler widget that can be fixed more readily. That's the only way, if that is the rate limiting step, that you're going to improve things. So very often when we give people precursors, the supply of tryptophan is not the rate limiting step in that person's brain for making more serotonin, then pushing in more tryptophan does not make the assembly line move faster, just piles up the basic ingredients. There are certain circumstances this can work and be effective, but it's why in general, Food isn't usually powerful medicine. Despite lots of the claims of superfoods, many of these ingredients get broken down in your body and reduced to simpler molecules. Step aside or go around for making more of a neurotransmitter is you could take a substance that actually imitates a neurotransmitter. And one of the best examples is nicotine. So nicotine is not a normal chemical that's found in the body. It's a chemical made in plants, particularly tobacco-related plants. But nicotine binds to the acetylcholine receptors and acts like acetylcholine at that subset of receptors. So that's a situation where you don't need to boost acetylcholine levels, but you can boost the effects of acetylcholine by taking an analog, something that binds to that receptor, such as nicotine. Two other ways, and these are the ways most commonly used by our drugs to boost neurotransmitter levels. In neurotransmission, we have one neuron here. The end of its axons, there's little vesicles, little containers, membrane-bound containers containing the neurotransmitters when the signal gets from this cell to release their neurotransmitters. The vesicles migrate to the synaptic cleft. They fuse with the synaptic cleft membrane. They release their contents. Those neurotransmitter molecules then diffuse in the small difference distance between the sending and receiving neurotransmitter. So it's a very small space. Then they bind to receptors on the receiving end. And then they have an action there on the receiving cell. If that was all that would happen, then you'd have an ongoing signal that would just be going on and on and on and on which wouldn't provide information. So the body needs ways to turn off the signal. So one is that neurotransmitters, once they bind to the receiving receptors, are actually diffusing on and off of that. And some of it depends on how tightly they're bound, their concentration, what else is going on in the synapse, but they're diffusing on and off. And some of them will diffuse back to the sending receptor and there are reuptake molecules here, transporters that pull them back into the first cell. And that's one way to end the signal. Another way is that there are degradative enzymes, mostly within the cells, but some in the synaptic space as well, that break down the neurotransmitter. So if it's broken down, then it can't keep binding to the receiving receptor. So a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's not creating more serotonin. It's not boosting level of serotonin, what it's doing is allowing that same amount of serotonin to last longer and therefore give a more strong signal to the receiving cell. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Paxil, Olaf, Lexapro. We have older drugs that aren't called reuptake inhibitors like the tricyclic antidepressants, which were essentially serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And the other way I mentioned is you can stop the breakdown, you can stop the catabolism. So we have drugs that are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Monoamines include simple amine molecules like the neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Those are usually, again, broken down 
by monoamine oxidase. If you give a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, it prevents that breakdown and allows the monoamine to last longer. We have drugs that are acetylcholine esterase inhibitors that prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, so allow acetylcholine to last longer. Another important breakdown molecule, particularly for dopamine and norepinephrine, is COMT or catecholamine O-methyltransferase. And there are several approved Parkinsonian drugs that are COMT inhibitors. Other ways of boosting neurotransmitters in the brain depends on that there's a differential distribution for some molecules or some drugs between the brain, which is highly fat soluble, and the body, which is more water soluble. And I have a recent video on this. Cobenfi, which is a new schizophrenia drug, uses two different drugs. Xanomaline, which is a muscarine, which is part of the acetylcholine system, agonist, so it activates acetylcholine. If it did that strongly in the body and in the brain, you'd have lots of digestive system problems and side effects. So this is a drug that combines xanomaline, which is a drug that gets very well penetrating into the brain, versus Trospium chloride and trospium chloride actually works exactly the opposite. It's a muscarinic blocking drug. So you'd think if I'm not taking the two together, I'd get nothing going on. But again, because of their physical properties, trospium is mostly acting in the body and the xanomeline is acting mostly in the brain. So it's this differential effect based on their physical properties. So in the body, the hope is if there's any xanomeline that's overactivating the Acetylcholine system, the trospium can block that because it's a blocker, but the trospium is not getting into the brain very well. So it's not blocking that muscarinic agonist, that acetylcholine receptor agonism activation in the brain. An even more complicated story on that is using drugs that are blocking degradation of the drug in your periphery, in your general body. And there's a very well established treatment for. Parkinson's disease using carbidopa and levodopa to essentially boost brain levels of dopamine. Dopamine itself does not get across the blood brain barrier very well. So, again, just feeding someone dopamine or even injecting dopamine isn't going to allow dopamine to enter the brain very well. So, levodopa, though, crosses the blood brain barrier easily and enters the brain and then is converted into dopamine. However, levodopa just floating around in your body is also broken down by different enzymes pretty quickly and then degrades and then you don't get make any dopamine out of it. So there is a separate drug called carbidopa. It blocks an enzyme called alamino decarboxylase, which is found in the body. So alamino decarboxylase is the drug that deactivates or breaks down L-dopa in the rest of the body. But if you give carbidopa, the L-dopa that's floating around in the body isn't being broken down. It's still present. It's allowed to be present in enough concentration that it, again, crosses the blood-brain barrier, goes into the brain, and can be converted into dopamine. For many of our mental health conditions, it's not clear, even though we've been focusing for years on drugs that are boosting things, why that would help, or if it does help, or again, more often, it's probably not the direct elevating levels of a signal, because if it worked that quickly, symptoms would improve quickly. Actually, many ADHD medications do have simple direct effects. So boosting dopamine or norepinephrine does seem to have some direct immediate effect at alleviating ADHD symptoms. Many of our slower acting antidepressants, slower acting anti-anxiety agents it's more an indirect effect of messing with neurotransmitter levels that seems to have any benefits.